let's get started. Our first speaker of the day is a very good friend of ours and one of our biggest fans out there. Toby calls himself a clean coder. Yeah, he's awesome. Um, and he's a full stack developer, Rubyist and Elixir passionate. He's the organizer of the Berlin Ruby user group and maintains, I don't know how many projects, like I read all of them and like, I don't know how he manages. <laughs> we all have one life unless, if you have a secret, share it. Um, gives, um, given his great experience as a Rails developer, today he's gonna guide us through approaches on how to tame validations and callbacks with, do you need that validation? Let me call you back on that. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, great. Okay, thanks everyone for making it. I know yesterday was party time, so you all had some time to enjoy and relax. And we're gonna start this off very slow. So to start it off, I'm gonna tell you a little story. I call this the story of the magic hook. So imagine we have a problem, or well, we have something that we wanna build. We wanna build a new application to manage events. And so a, an event has a name, has a location, has a date, and then at some time the crew arrives, and then performers arrive, and so on and so forth. However, our events are just user groups, so they only ever take place on like one day at a time, or we always just want to manage them one day at a time. So this is fairly repetitive. Uh, we want them to be date times so that they can be efficiently compared in the database with like other dates. Um, and we have to enter the, um, the date all the time. This sucks, you know? We want to do, we want to be user friendly, UX and stuff, you know? So this is obviously much better. We just enter the date once and then we enter all the times. Great. So what do we have to do to make this work? So we write this code. So this is a before validation that called set date times to date. We first get the base date, which is our date field, and we convert it to date time so we can mingle with it. Then we have a constant that is called the date time fields, uh, which is all the fields that we want to set to that specific date, so our crew arrives at and whatnot. We get the original time of that field. Then we adjust the time, so we take our base date and we change the hour and the minutes to the hour and minutes that we entered. And then we fancily meta program and set, oops, my shadow, and set the that value. And so how does it look like? We create a new event, which is Ruby on Ice, on Tegernsee, on the 24th. And then, okay, the crew didn't actually arrive at 6.45, um, but <laughs> I arrived somewhat around 9.30, so that's okay. So if we call valid, then all of a sudden it's all populated, it's all Sunday, 24th February, we converted all of them, fine, right? So this is some actual magic, you know? We don't need to make anything else, this just works for us. But wait a second, is this really such a good idea? Let's write a test. So we want to build a new event. Um, this uses factory bot. And then we just send, OK, you event, you end in the year 2042. Well, now we write a test. And so first, we look at the end of the event. And first, it's, for, it's really the 1st of January 2042. After we save it, however, our magic hook triggers and says, no, 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 no. You're not 1st of January 2020. 2042, um, you're in 2019 and the 24th of February because that's uh, what the date is in the factory. And that is very, very surprising. And it's probably not as surprising to you right now because I showed you all of this right now. But now imagine you're writing a test for something completely different. Um, you've wrote this magic callback, you wrote it a year ago. And now you want to write a new query that wants to figure out, you know, I want to have future events that are past the next 23 years. And so I create this event, and I know I just look at the NZ field. So I want to create it with the NZ field set to more than 23 years in the future. And this just creates it, and then my query doesn't include the event. I will spend hours of debugging because I think my query is wrong. I won't think that like my factory is wrong, that the setup is wrong. I'll first always look for the fault in the code that I just wrote because I don't even know about the other code. Right now, we're even maybe lucky if we're bad off, then that callback is hidden somewhere in a concern, and we just find it very, very late, you know? And, <laughs> and I'm not telling you this, like, this is an adjusted example, but I have spent hours debugging this very same problem. So it is not made up. So what do I think about this? Like, I think before validation callbacks are a smell. 
um, as well as like an indication that something's wrong. There might be, like, there could be scenarios where this is a good idea. It's just very, very hard to think of them for me right now because my question is like, why does the model have to care about like cleaning up this data that it has passed? Why is this the model's problem? Shouldn't this be handled before? We did this specifically for one or two views, for the create event view and for the edit event view. We did it for nothing else. But this before validation copy will be run all the time, no matter if we go through that view or not. This is very view-specific code that clutters our model. Callbacks aren't the only thing that clutters your model uh, with something that's very, very view-specific. Let's talk about validations. So this is uh, from the GitLab code base, uh, is the user model. And I have to say before, I take this example not because I think there are bad engineers at GitLab, the opposite. I do it because I think there are very, very good engineers at GitLab, and it is open source, which I'm very, very thankful for, so I can show you this example. So if anything, I take this as an example of these are good engineers, and why are they doing this? So if we look at this, there's a bunch of customly written validations for like unique email, owns notification email, what, and they all check, oh, did the email change? Did the notification email change? Did this change? Did that change? And why are they doing this? Why are they doing all this effort to just be like, oh, like I write this validation that should run all the time, but then like, no, you don't run. You don't run. Like it's like a goalkeeper that tries to catch all the balls that are coming his way. So to take German or European football this time around as an example. <laughs> Um, and like, why, like, kind of like, if we stick with the analogy, why isn't the ball already called in the midfield or in the defenders? Why is the goalkeeper like the last possible instance? Why is that the one that has to be like, okay, you don't get in here, you don't get, you don't get in here? It's a clear sign that like we don't want to run this all the time, but we put it somewhere where it's run all the time, uh, but we could catch it earlier. And now you might be like, oh, Toby, you know, you said that maybe they do it for performance reasons, you know, because those validations are very, very expensive or because data is complete. But validations are very, very fast. You know, you validate the presence of something, it's super fast. Well, that validation is super fast. But let's take the example that we have a doctor's appointment. And a doctor's appointment needs to have a practice, needs to have a doctor, needs to have a patient, and it belongs to all of these. So first, when we make the appointment, it maybe has like a time frame or whatnot. Um, we want to see, is the practice actually open at that time? Is the overlap of other appointments of both my doctor and my practice? Because there shouldn't be, because I want to be at my appointment when I can be. Does the doctor have the right skills to actually treat me for that appointment that I have? Can the patient be contacted? These are all like associations that I need to check, and sometimes when I want to check for an overlap, I actually need to change uh, to check multiple other appointments if I don't overlap with any of them. Those are all very, very expensive database operations that I have to perform on, upon every uh, validation. And of course, it gets even worse if I change associated models because they also all run all of their validations and whatnot. And there's so many more examples that I could make here. So validations aren't for free, at least the ones that you know mean anything. Another problem that this leads to is um, when you do your test setup, it can be very, very expensive. Uh, starting, I think, in Rails 5, but I might be mistaken, uh, the belongs to relationship is never um, optional, so you always check on every uh, valid call if all of your belongs to's are there, which in theory is a good thing. Uh, <laughs> In practice, maybe as well, but for testing practices, often not, because oftentimes you will need records in the database to perform whatever test you want to perform. And if we stick for our appointment example, then if I want to create an appointment, because it belongs to the practice, I also need to have the practice in the database. I need to have the doctor in the database. I need to have the patient in the database. It doesn't stop there, though, because the practice also is in some kind of area and then has some kind of tariff systems and tariffs and whatnot. And all of these need to be, need to exist in the database because of the validations that are run or because of belongs to relationships. We checked this once in, uh, in a code base I was working on, and in order to create our core model, we needed to create, like, to, to be fully valid with like, everything around it, we need to create 23 models uh, of 23 rows in the database. And that is really, really bad, because then it's no wonder that like, the test you takes 20 minutes to run or something if for your core thing you need to create that many records in the database. And this is just the default that leads you there and gets you for a very, very painful test setup uh, just to make everything valid and in a good state. Well, looking back at that GitLab user code, I actually didn't show you everything of it. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, it, it's not all of it, so I cut out the validations and callbacks that do not have anything to do uh, with emails. But here you can see all of those are checking if like some 
some way or some form of, of uh, validation changed, uh, of some email changed, I'm sorry. And I'm asking myself, like, how many ways can it possibly be to change an email in GitLab? Like, I don't know, but I would guess it's maybe two or three, at most four. But the user model is used everywhere, and it's touched also in lots of places. And so we are that goalkeeper that goes around this thing and tries to you know, not let these validations through or these callbacks uh, because they're very, very expensive to do. And I don't know, this doesn't look uh, quite right to me. And just to be clear here, I'm not saying that these ifs are bad. These ifs are just a symptom. Like, I also, I have code that looks like that. And if code doesn't look like that, maybe it should look like that because maybe it executes validations all the time that it shouldn't because nothing that it concerns ever changed. To give you a little example, if we stick with our appointment from before, if we change the state of the appointment from like open to done or something or something, do we need to change, uh, do we need to check all the validations and callbacks that belong to times? No, we didn't change the times. Why would we run all of those? It makes no sense. So there probably should be these ifs. So they're more a symptom than the actual problem. Um, if you know me, you know that I have a special relationship with comments. So when I looked at this, I looked at these uh, comments. And funnily enough, it said, in case validation is skipped. It's like, hmm, interesting. So I looked a bit further up. And then you can see that we execute the exact same callbacks, like set public email and set commit email twice. Once for before validation and once for before save. Just in case somewhere, some, someone somewhere decides that, you know, before we don't want to run validations here because they're expensive, la, la, la. So we do skip validation true, but just so that they really always happen when we add a before save callback. And again, I, I trust the engineers at GitLab a lot. Something drove them. Um, to do this. And, but like, it also leads to the case that now we're executing them twice if we don't skip validations. And so my big question is, why are we doing this? Why is this something that is like, actually remotely something that we think we want to write as code and we think is actually good code? And like, I stopped thinking like this. And, but like, I thought for about this for a long time. Like, is this just me and my team? Like, for a bit, I was also nervous that like everybody here would be like, oh, we never write code like this. Like, oh, this is boring. I, I hope that's not your current feeling, <laughs> because otherwise, uh, yeah, it will be fun. Um, so I thought about it for a long time. And what I came up with an answer, and bear with me here for a bit, is that this is actually about affordances. Um, affordance is a term I learned in a course about human-computer interaction and basically user experience design that really stuck with me. Um, the definition that I know, or the easiest definition that I know, is basically how does an object want to be used, or how does something want to be used. A door handle is easy. I see a door handle, I know, okay, door handle wants to be pushed. Button wants to be pressed. A chair, it's very easy to sit on. That's sort of how it communicates that it wants to be used. For instance, or for another example, these are nice little bunnies. They want to be cuddled. You see that in their wonderful little eyes. Or something else that they want is they want to be fed naturally. So that is also something how an object wants to be used. How does this relate to anything? How do we translate this to programming? When we want to do a new solution and an object-oriented language, we go, OK, we want to do like some class that represents my solution space or my problem space, and then we implement a method that is the solution. That is like the affordance that object-oriented programming gives me. Like in functional programming, I'll write a function, input, output, and it's a bit different. So what is the affordance that we have in Rails? Rails is model view controller. That is what Rails does. And so where do we put our solution here? We're obviously not in the view, right? Like views should be slim. We shouldn't put like logic there. We've gone so far. So we have the model and the controller. But then we have fat models, skinny controllers, which I think originated in 2008. And it, it's a good thing. I'm not saying that this is a bad thing. But it says we shouldn't put the logic in the controllers. So we should put the logic in the models. And then so it's not a question at all. We should put all the logic in the models, because that's the only place that the affordance of like normal rates tells us to put things. And what this ends up as is that we have like one or two use cases in the application, like, I don't know, signing up or something, and they impact every model that it can possibly touch, and it all sticks with that model all the time. To illustrate, so we have controllers, we have models, and the controller calls out to the model. We build something new. We build like a registrations controller for sign up or whatnot that has an impact on the user model. Now we have another like users controller that shows users, indexes users, maybe as like a CSV export or something has an impact on the model. 
And there are many more like this. And all of a sudden, our, mo our model has grown very, very big, and it's just a big mashup of concerns um, that represent these, like every one of these had an impact. Like business logic was added, validation was added, a callback was added, whatnot. Well, now you might be like, oh, no, 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 Toby, we have service objects. <laughs> um, I, so service objects is like a whole other topic, and I personally like service objects. Um, but I know people have their problems with them as well. But at some point, like years back, people said, like, okay, we don't want to have all this business logic on the models. Let's like extract some of that to layer above. Let's do some service objects. So that alleviates some of the problem. Like not every call has to go through service object, can also go right down, but you know, it's just a schematic. So we see our model has gotten a bit smaller, but we still have an impact from every action that we ever implemented. So our business logic can now be separated, which is a good thing. However, the validations and callbacks are still mixed in the model because uh, you don't usually do them in service objects. And also, um, I think they're even worse than having the business logic in the model because validations and callbacks by default are run all the time. Um, whereas the business logic is only run when I tell it to. And you know, my namespace in my model might get crowded, my model might get super big and might be hard to manage, but at least it's only run when I tell it to. Not so much with validation and callbacks. Um, I actually had one uh, case where in a production application, there was a uh, stack tra system stack trace error because two validation, uh, no, two before safe callbacks were playing ping pong with each other. And then I had to debug that funny thing because, uh, yeah, it just, it only happened if it was a full moon in February and right now it was 13 o'clock or something. It was very, very hard to debug, like, good fun. So. I've also actually been lying to you a bit because uh, I don't only have controllers, service objects, and models, we also have views. Um, and now you say, no, 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 Toby, views don't call controllers. This is all wrong. And you're right. But the views, or especially the forms, they, um, they dictate what the data structures that the controller deals with looks like. They dictate how the params hash looks like that you get into the controller. So that's what I mean here. I don't mean they call them, but they influence like, what uh, structure of data arrives there. So let's take one little example of view, controller, service, model, the sign up one. Let's take like a typical Rails user model, I would say. And so let's see, like I only took the concerns that I want to talk about here because obviously user models are often much, much bigger. Most of you know that, I guess. Um, these validations and these copies, like basically everything that I show you, all of this is just related to sign up. Like, Otherwise, I don't care if like an email is entered, is entered. Maybe at login and registration, maybe edit. Otherwise, not. Same for password. Same for the terms that I accepted, the terms of the service, and also this password accessor, hashing the password, and sending a welcome email. I don't care about that under any other circumstance. Some of these are even worse for me. Some of them are purely view related. That I have the confirmation matcher here is the knowledge that in my um, sign up and edit form or whatnot, I have a separate field that is called password confirmation or email confirmation. The view, um, the knowledge of the view leaks down all the way to the model. And my personal favorite is validates terms acceptance true. We're not even saving that in the database. It's just there. It's a purely view related concern that I can pass the validation on the view, but it's all the way down in my core user model. So the question is why? Why do we have that knowledge down here about how something up there looks like. And so why am I solving this problem of validations and callbacks all the way down here? And it's all upped out, like they all run all the time. And why am I playing this game? It's like, I don't want to do this right now. I don't want to do this right now when I could be different. So my view of how things work is a bit like this. So at first we say, hey, run all the callbacks all the time. This is great. This is exactly what we should be doing. But then we change, like, oh, well, actually, now like, I want to run this callback because it gives me a weird bug, and that callback, and that is slow, and that validation. No, 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 like, don't do any of that. And that is sort of like the deny list. Whereas I think, like, OK, but like, because in the model, we have lost all knowledge where we actually come from. You know? We don't know what action was executed anymore. So why can't we move it up here, maybe between the controller and the servers? Why? Because there we know what control action we're in. We know exactly which values we want to change. Maybe we could even move it up here. You know, maybe when the request comes in, we already do the validation in like, I don't know, a rack middleware or something before we ever hit the controller, because we also know exactly where we are. So I'm more like, run exactly the callbacks that I want to run. So what is this? 
you've just seen me complain about validations of callbacks for 20 minutes. Uh, is this a good use of your time? Uh, <laughs> I hope so. Um, I just want to be very, very clear on the problems as I perceive them, because if I start telling you about solutions without us being clear on the problems, none of you will listen to me. None of you will care. And maybe you already knew the problems, then good for you. But I think it's very important to take these, put them into perspective, what's the actual problem that we want to solve, and then look at some possible solutions or alternatives. So as was said before, my name is Toby. You can find me everywhere on the internet as Pragtop, which is not for the city of Prague, but for the pragmatic from PragPub and the pragmatic program and all that stuff. Um, <laughs> because I was asked a question yesterday, and this talk is titled, Do You Need That Validation? Let me call you back about it. Big shout out to my friend Jason Clark who came up with that title. So to summarize, what are the perceived problems that I am presenting here to you and I hope you at least to some level agree with? Um, first, the specifics of some feature that is only used in like one or two control actions or something clutter the model, which makes it very, very hard to get an overview of about anything because it's all mixed together. You don't know what is happening at what time, and then you opt out or opt in, no, well, you opt out at certain times. And the worst thing for me is, is that they run all the time, which leads to funny interactions between the callbacks, which actually make debugging hell. Um, you have other problems, like that it takes a long time, so it has a big impact on performance, and in general, test setup can be very, very harsh. So we will go through this next section looking at sort of our active record original and see how we can make it better. But before we do so, um, we look at what does Rails have in store? Is there no solution for this in Rails? Also in standard vanilla Rails, let's say. And one thing that you can come up with and say like, oh, let's just put all of this in a concern. So you can just do the included do and put all of the validations in a concern that you call user, regi user registration and then just include it in the user model. Um, does this solve our problem? Well, it gives us a grouping, so the model itself isn't cluttered anymore, but all of those validations and callbacks are still run all the time. So I don't think this is much better. It actually hides what we're doing. So it's sort of like a little Band-Aid somewhere. It's not a real solution. Then we have suppress, which is <laughs> my favorite thing in the world. Um, I have actually forgotten about this. Like Preparing this talk, I was talking to a good colleague. Hi, Tiago. Um, and I was like, oh, is there any solution? He was like, oh, yeah, there's, there's Suppress. I was like, oh, my god, I forgot about this. If you also forgot about Suppress or never knew what it was, um, Suppress, uh, within this block, no notification uh, record will be created. You just suppress notification. Why would you do that? Maybe because you want to copy a project over, and then you create new project instances, new topic instances, and new comments or something, but you don't want to uh, send notifications for it because you're just copying it, right? And so by not creating any notification instances, you also don't trigger any after save or after commit callbacks on the notification model. So it doesn't matter. Uh, I don't think this is a good solution. And like, I was very happy that when I checked, I checked both the GitLab and the discourse code base, and none of them used suppress, which made me very happy. <laughs> and we have something else. Uh, we can also have uh, custom contexts. Uh, you know, you probably know that on validations, and, uh, you can pass on create, on update, or something, and you can pass your own symbol, account setup, or something, and then you have to pass the symbol explicitly when either saving or validating something. This kind of solves our problem, um, but only for validations, because then we can say we say explicitly, okay, I want to run the validations for account setup, and then they only run when I explicitly tell them to, which is good. However, they still clutter the model, and as far as I'm aware, they don't apply to callbacks. So it's also not a real solution. So what do I think is out there? What do I think is ways that we can change this or ways that we can do this? First, form objects. And yes, for the keen-eyed people, she is holding the pen in the wrong direction. It was the only picture that I found. <laughs> Bear with me. <laughs> um, so um, there's lots of... Uh, form uh, object libraries out there, and we will also like quickly mention some of them later. But I wanted to just go with plain um, active model because you already have active model in your Rails application. It's very easy to get started. You don't need to add like an extra gem, so you can sneak it in more easily than adding another gem. So, yes, we have the same validations as we had before. They are exactly the same, so it's very very familiar. Uh, we need to add extra accessors, though, because we pass this object to the view, so that object needs to have like all the available setters um, to deal with your form. And then 
we sort of map it to Active Record. And here we want to really adhere to the interface that Active Record provides so it looks exactly the same when we use it. So we define a safe mo method ourselves that, if that returns true and false just as a normal Active Record method would. And the valid method is already given to us by Active Model. Uh, model. And so then what do we do? Um, we kind of execute our callbacks very much in line. So instead of having a callback that sets the password digest to something, we just have a um, method called hash password, and we pass in the result of that to our base user model, which has none of these validations or callbacks. And similarly, after we save the user, we just execute a method called send welcome email. It's very easy and plain to see when what thing happens. It's very easy to change around. With callbacks and validations, especially if you have like other models associated, like I don't know when what is executed. Like there's the weirdest circumstances when I think sometimes when you even assign uh, a has one or belongs to association, it gets automatically saved and then the callbacks are run. And like good luck keeping an overview of all of that. Here it's very plain and simple. And it's the same interface. So our controller just looks like that. We create the registration object with our params, and then we just handle it with safe and whatnot. It's very easy. OK, let's skip to another approach, uh, which I call the inheritance approach. And this is what our code looks like. And you can see that we inherit from something very, very weird. And this is a library called Active Type, which is actually made here in Bavaria, more precisely in Augsburg, if I'm not mistaken. Yes? OK. Um, so what is this? This is original, and this is Active Type. Looks exactly the same. And why are we doing this? Uh, or like, how does this even work? So we just use inheritance, which I know lots of people aren't a fan of inheritance, and there's times where you can use it and where you shouldn't use it. Um, in this case, our user model appears just again, doesn't have any of these validations and callbacks. And so we just add them on our subclass. And then just here we add the validations and stuff that are important for that one specific use case. And then we're ready to go. We just use this uh, class uh, instead of our normal user class. And now you might ask, like, why do I need a library for that? You know, like I can just use inheritance myself, no problem. Um, active type deals, uh, for one thing, uh, with uh, special cases, such as that if you have single table inheritance, you probably don't want the class user as sign up to end up in your type column. And active type takes care of that, as well as routing. So you don't want to, when you redirect to user, you don't want to end up with like user as sign up path, but you want to end up with user path. And so it takes care of all of this. And on top, it's also a form object library. So even if you don't have something that maps directly to a model, you can use active type and to write a form. So I think this is probably the easiest to get into uh, approach. If I would rank approaches on maybe like, I, I don't want to say Railsiness, but this seems like something that I could see maybe happen in Rails, that this would be accepted. But well, I don't know too well. Now we come to change sets, which is my personal favorite. I will lead with that. Um, so this is a change set, and you can see that this is not Ruby. This is Elixir. You will probably be able to read it because it's very um, Ruby-ish. And I just need to tell you one thing real quick about this. This is the pipe operator, and what the pipe operator basically does is, so this is already a user change set, and the pipe passes this user in as the first argument to the cast function. And then whatever the cast function returns, which is a change set again, gets passed into the validate required function as the first argument. This returns a change set again, passes into the next one, et cetera. Um, why am I talking to you about Alex here? I really, really like this approach, and I think you should know it, because I think it's really, really good. But I haven't found an approach quite like it in the Ruby ecosystem. I think Hanami has something that's called change sets, but they're different. They don't deal with validations. So uh, one more thing. A recent change that I made in Phoenix, which is basically Rails for Elixir. I hope Chris will forgive me that. Um, so this is a context. You can see this, that this is not our general user model that is used everywhere, but it's a specific. It's used in a specific context. So we say like, okay, we have user, but this is the user we use when we talk about accounts. And it also just takes a subset of like the database fields and whatnot. And you have many of these contexts, and so many user models for different contexts, which is a very interesting concept. A concept. So what do we do first? This cast function is basically strong parameters. So it tells you which, um, which of the passed in 
keys of the attributes are actually allowed to change the comma. And so we, here we say we can only change email, password, and terms of service. That's all we can change. Then we have all of our validations, much as before, validate required, confirmed, validate the length, and validate the acceptance of the terms of service. And then in the end, we have like our callback, which in this case is like a before, after validation something thing, but we know exactly where it's executed. Now some of you might be a bit cautious and be like, wait a second, Toby, you just told me that this thing is strong parameters, validations, and callbacks. You're mixing all the concerns. This is so wrong. We always want to have separate concerns. You know, we don't want to mix all of the things up. And at this point, I will argue in the opposite direction because I said it's my favorite approach. Um, this one gives me exactly what I need to know. I know that in here, only the email, the password, and the terms of service can change. So I know for a fact that I, know that I only need to run validations for emails, passwords, and the terms of service. I don't need to care about anything else because I don't allow anything else to change. With our example of the doctor's appointment before, if only the state changes, I allow only the state to change. And then I don't care about the times because I know the times couldn't possibly have changed. And so I don't even run into this problem. And now you might just be like, ah, I don't believe you, and that's fine. It took me a long time myself sort of to get accustomed to change sets. But remember our user model from GitLab. All of this is so concerned with like what type of uh, attributes can possibly change. And so it's clear that there's a connection for me. Like what attributes can change is clearly connected to what validations I want to run and what callbacks I want to run. This has become so clear to me. This is why I like this approach um, so much. It's also worth knowing that you can have multiple of these change sets because they're all just functions. You just create a new change set functions, and then you have a different change set, and you can even um, combine them. So here, before I do all the stuff that I do, I go through my base change set, which maybe has validations that I always want to execute, and so I can combine them as I wish. And so I also don't have to you know, duplicate all this code all the time. It's very, very nice. Of course, as with the others, this also has the little caveat that well, in general, while we, when we run everything all the time, it's, there's a very slim chance that we forget to run something. Here, there's a chance that we might forget to run something. I specifically know of uh, friends that forgot to run some callbacks related to payments, which, you know, can hurt you quite a lot. <laughs> but, you know, bugs happen everywhere. Okay, how is this used? This is the context. So Phoenix also did this very interesting thing where they say, uh, Phoenix is not your web application. So you have a simpler, like in newer versions, you have like a separate web app, and then you have sort of like a business logic app that you call into. And this is the interface into our accounts context. So we don't use anything from below that namespace directly. We all go through this extra sort of API layer. Uh, and here's how we define create user there. We first use our change set, then we inserted it into the database. And then afterwards, we send a welcome email. We know exactly where what thing happens. It's perfectly clear. No guessing. It's all there. Oh, and how is this used in the controller? Then we just call account create user, and then we do all the other stuff, which is uh, super fine. OK. Um, the fourth and sort of last approach I will talk about today I call it separate operations and validators, and which is something which is used quite a bit by which I would call sort of newer H uh, Ruby frameworks, so Hanami, the Dryab ecosystem, and Trailblazer. I'm going to take Trailblazer as an example, but also for the ones of you that are really into Trailblazer, I'm not a Trailblazer expert. Um, what Trailblazer does is it wants to break up all of this, and it's certainly like the most, I don't know, sophisticated or the most involved approach. So. And Travis say, OK, in a controller, we only run an operation. And that operation we break up into maybe what's a policy, so who is able to access and do this at all. We have separate validations. And yeah, that's how they do it. So let's look at an example. This is what the controller looks like. Um, so we call the registration create operation with the parameters. And then it's just a normal controller, mostly. So this is the operation. What does the operation look like? This is the Trailblazer operation. And then what do we do? First, we set up the model, which we, is basically a fancy way of saying base user new. Um, and then we build a contract. Um, a contract is the validation layer here. And we have this create contract. So it's also very, very specifically um, scoped to this. And 
this validation is basically a form object. As we've seen before, this one uses uh, reform, which is another library to do form objects and validations. And so I just stripped away a bit of the setup stuff here so we can have a look at this. So up here, I define all the properties that there are in the form, so email, email confirmation, and so on and so forth. Lots of those attributes are virtual because they're not actually written back to uh, the model that we have lying underneath that sort of back us up here. And what's also fun here, or what you can do, is you can also have some type coercion, which uses dry types, I think, with types params uh, bool. Also down here, reform is basically kind of like a meta library, so you can also use reform with active model, although I think they removed the support uh, for active model now, but you were uh, able to use it. But I used the excellent dry validation gem here. So then you say what validations do I run, and then okay, same thing, we want to have an email that should be confirmed, we want to have a password that should have at least the size should be confirmed and the terms done. So back in our operation, what do we do is then we validate everything and then we have a separate step which is called hash password where we do the password hashing. So here's again like sort of like a after validation thing. Then we do the persist. So the persist just writes all the values back into uh, the model that we want to write them to. And then in the end, we send the welcome email. So this is, <laughs> okay, why well, we still have the slide. Um, I think it's a very interesting way to think about things. I'm not sure yet if it's like my favorite project. I think there's lots of good ideas here, but honestly, writing this, some of it was rather involved. That should have been simple, um, I feel. And also, I even said to say, and I hope Nick doesn't see this, like right now, I can't really um, recommend getting into like doing this. I had to fight with quite some outdated documentation, some gems where I had to give like an RC release version or something. So maybe if you want to look into this, then maybe Trailblazer isn't the first place to look at right now, but that might change. But as I said, for instance, Hanami also follows a very, very similar approach. And so, of course, um, maybe you know this or you don't know this, um, I'm not the first person to tell you about all these things. I think Nick has been, has been raging about some of these things for a long time, so has Piotr Solnitscher. Um, so just, this is not just like I don't know, my idea, I'm just the person presenting it uh, to you here right now. Um, this is from the Trailblazer docs. Models are persistence only and solely define association and scopes. No business code is to be found here. No validations, no callbacks, because all of that goes into the operations. And then this is from the Hanami, um, read me from Hanami model. The architecture is keeping the business logic and it is separated from details such as uh, persistence of validations. So this is an approach that sort of like gets uh, more, more steam as we roll along. So I think it's very, very interesting. So in the end, and wow, it was a lot faster than I expected, um, the takeaway what are the takeaways here for you? What can you take home and apply at home? First, I just want to say something. I don't hate Rails. <laughs> I hope it didn't come across as such, but like, I'm, very, I'm immensely thankful for Rails. It has impacted my career and certainly lots of yours' careers a lot of uh, ways. There's lots of good people that do like, very, very good work there and has helped lots of companies and uh, lots of um, individual people as well. So this is not an like, I hate Rails talk. Um, but at the same time, like I have to ask myself the question, or maybe you ask yourself the question, is there a future for any of this in Rails, for like form objects or whatnot of this? And I would like to tell you yes, but I don't think so. Um, in preparation for this talk, I was like, uh, again, a colleague said to me, oh, watch like DHH's, um, what's it called, DHH on writing software well uh, videos, and I watched the one on callbacks. And in it, DHH was basically, Callbacks are so great, you know? This is just an auxiliary concern. Like, where would I put this? In the service object or in the controller or something? Like, no, just put it in this callback here. And then, like, some of these callbacks had these if change, where, like, oh, only execute if this, this, and this. And I was like, oh my God. Like, this is like the exact opposite opinion. I don't, like, I don't want to make fun of DHH. DHH is a great programmer. He brought us all of these things. And it's certainly working for him. But because it's working for him so well, and he has these very, very strong opinions against form objects or whatnot. I don't see them end up in Rails. I was actually um, talking about this a bit, and then um, a friend of mine uh, said, uh, Peter said, like, yeah, it would be so good if we just said, you know, services and form objects 
in Rails because it seems to be, at least from my experience, what kind of the majority of people I know and talk to use at least service objects, but I don't think they will ever find a way um, into Rails. And it would be so good if, I don't know, we just had a services folder or a form objects folder because, again, this, is, this relates back to affordances. Because how does Rails want to be used? Again, everything is pushed to the model by like sort of the default way, or at least how I understand uh, the default way. Because there's no services folder, so it feels wrong. Like, oh, is this really Rails when I'm doing this if I create like a service object? No, this is not Rails. And so you put it into the model because you don't think Rails wants to be used that way. And again, if also if you think that everything that I said today is total bollocks, please. Just take away this, oh, you don't even see these things. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, if you think that everything that I said today is total bollocks, and if you love your validations and callbacks on your model, it's fine, good for you. But take away the concept of affordances. Take it with you, think about it. When you write something, especially when you write a library, think about what is the affordance of this? What do I make it easy to be used like? What do I make it hard to be used like? Um, I have some very cool examples from sort of the Elixir space. There's sometimes I, I use something like, why is this so hard? Why is this function like not just the default argument? And like, this is weird. And then you Google it, and you come up with uh, a GitHub issue, and then Josie explains very calmly that what you're actually trying to do is an anti-pattern in most cases. So that he intentionally makes it hard to use it that way. It's possible, but he makes it hard. And that's like the also another way that affordance works. Not only what is easy, but what do you make hard? And like in very early versions of Ecto, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, Ecto had callbacks. They removed callbacks which might have been the single best desi design decision that they ever made, in my opinion. So what are the alternatives again? You can use form objects, uh, which with active model are pretty easy to use. Just you know, sneak into your code base. That's what we've been doing for a long time. It's very good. It's just all there. Create a form objects folder or whatnot. Just start using them. It's very easy. Um, the inheritance-based approach, I think, is very, very cool because you sort of you don't have to really learn anything new, which sounds kind of sad, but it's also sort of a testament of like how well it is designed because you can use these new concepts by just you know making a subclass and continue to do what you do just in a more scoped space. So it's it's a very easy avenue uh, to go to start using these things. Change sets are my personal favorite, and <laughs> when I gave this talk to uh, Yelena, she said, like, oh, Toby, you can't just tell people that your change sets are your favorite thing, but you all can't use them because they're not there in Ruby. You should write a change set library for Ruby. I'm like, well, you know, maybe, but I think it's a bigger undertaking that with all my other open source projects I want to take on right now. But here, really, the direct connection between the attributes that are allowed to change, the validations I want to run, and then the callbacks I want to run is really what makes this my favorite approach at the moment. And then you can also look at lots of separate operations and uh, but that's like a whole separate thing because that's a whole new architecture. Everything else you can sort of plug in very, very easily into your existing code base. This is a whole other architecture which also you need to change the way you look at things quite a bit to see like how to use that and that can be quite hard. Like I certainly started with it when I first like wanted to write, not just think about the conception, oh, conception, that sound, sounds nice, but really, really write it was hard also for me. And then in the end, you know, just be careful with your validations, callbacks, and ask yourself, do you really need, need that validation? And hope nobody calls you back about it. Thank you, Toby. That was a great talk. And it's good to see that. Thank you. That it's our gift for you. This is your second, right? This is my second, yes. Good, good. You're I'm very happy that I was allowed back here. <laughs> we hope to see you next week.